their first solo album called Hot Animal Machine. Um, the Black Flag broke up in July of 1986. By autumn of that year, I was in England making my first solo record. I realized if I did not hit the ground running, I would not have a chance trying to make more music. And so the band breaks up in July. By October, I've made an album and EP. By April of the 87, I've been band practice. By May, I'm on stage with a new band. I, I just went, just knowing that is my choice. Drop and go. And so I have completed these sessions in England for about $1,500. Me and some friends, we got together, we wrote a bunch of songs in a freezing room in Leeds, England, uh, high on tea and Indian food. All we could afford, it's a great time. And so I get back and I don't have enough money for album artwork. My roommate uh, is a, a woman named Laura and she's a layout and design person. So I basically bought her groceries for like two weeks and she laid out some press type for me. She goes, what are you gonna do for a cover? I go like, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I could have called Ray Pettibone, the great guy who did all the Black Flag cover artwork, and uh, we used to be roommates. He would have given me some artwork, but it would look like a Black Flag record. I don't want to do that. So I, I don't know. I don't know many people. You know, I just kind of live alone. I'm a psycho. And she goes, well, I know Mark Mothersbaugh. I'm like, how do you get to know Mark Mothersbaugh? Because like Devo's one of the best bands ever. And so she goes, ah, we're just friends. She used to be a receptionist at Record Plant. I think she met him when he was there one day. Anyway. Um, he's like, how about we get you two introduced? So I get to meet Mark Mothersbaugh of Devo, and I grew up loving that band. And so I, I not only meet Mark, but I also meet Bob Mothersbaugh, Bob One of Devo, that guitar player is still in the band, and they're doing their final tour right now. And Mark and I seem to get along. He's a, a, a full-blown genius. I said, Mark, I, I'm, I'm a broke-ass guy, and, and I, I, I needed some album artwork, and he said, let me hear the music. So I played him the music, and he drew up this cover for me. And he goes, uh, how much can you give me? I'm like, I, I have the proverbial pot that you can also piss in. And so he made me this really good deal. Like, like he doesn't need money, but he took some of mine. Like, why not? It's capitalism. And I paid him some money. He was like getting a, my gallbladder removed anyway. Uh, that's how uh, I got to know Mark. And that's how his artwork appeared on my record. And it was a big shot in the arm for my little record. Like, Mark Mother's Boss Art is on your record. Dude, how did you do that? I'm like, my roommate, I just got lucky. And uh, it was so great to be able to have one of my favorite musicians work on my cover. Because I've made a lot of records, I've sold a lot of records, but at the end of the day, I'm a fan. And I'd rather be a fan than a musician. I much more enjoyed buying records than making records. I'd rather buy a record than sell a record, unless I'm not on it. Uh, so. Uh, it was an honor to be a Devo fan and have the Devo guy on the cover of my record. And that's kind of how it happened. My roommate knew this guy. And so Laura was one of the funniest people I ever met. She's also clinically depressed and she would take like real depression pills, like whatever they take and uh, what they give you. And uh, years after we were no longer roommates, somewhere in the 90s, she was, in, she was living with some guy in uh, Hollywood and she got into an argument with him and uh, she started attacking him. And like, he got so scared of her, he called the cops and the cops, she locked herself in her bedroom. The cops came with a knocking on the door and she shot herself in the head. And so Laura's gone. And uh, I found out that I was doing a benefit for a children's orphanage the night I found that out. Someone told me and I had to go on stage and try to be funny. So that was a tense evening. Martin Rev are uh, uh, the entirety of a two person band called Suicide. And uh, if you've ever heard the first Suicide album, it's, it's the self-titled one. It says Suicide on the cover, like bloody red uh, dripping uh, writing. Uh, the two most popular songs on the record produced by Craig Leon and Marty Thau uh, is Ghost Rider and one called Rocket USA. It is one of the most amazing records I've ever heard in my life. I bought it for $2.99 with a corner cut off. I bought it because I could afford it. It was one hour of minimum wage pay and it said suicide with blood. And I flipped over the back of these like two crazy looking guys on the back cover and it said Martin Rev, instrument, Alan Vega, voice. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> Ian McKay and I, I, I bought the record. And so we went up to Ian's mom's stifling attic where Ian lived on Beecher Street and we put on the first suicide record and we listened to it. And we're two young punk rock idiots. Nothing in our combined record collections prepared us for this record. There's nothing on it. It's like keyboard and vocal. 
And one of the records, one of the songs on the B side is called Frankie Teardrop. It is, in my opinion, the single most intense song ever committed to vinyl. Like, listen, and you might disagree, <laughs> but you have to admit, it's in your top three most intense songs. I won't detail it. I will beg you to go on YouTube and check it out. There's two different versions. You want to hear the original. The alt vocal's interesting, but it's the original that I was, I'm talking about. So for the rest of the evening, having been completely mind-blown by this record, all Ian and I could do was make fun of it because we were too immature to take it in. And the song Frankie Teardrop, Alan Vega goes like, Frankie Teardrop? It's about a guy who, just listen to it. And all we just kind of ran around the neighborhood for the rest of the night going, Frankie, Frankie, he's like laughing. And we laughed because we were kind of speechless. So I got the record back to my miserable apartment and I was listening to it. And the more I listened to it, the more I reckoned, this is one of the best bands ever. So I paid attention to Suicide. When I could afford to buy their records, I would. And over the years, the two of them would make solo records. It's like 1980-something, 1990, I think it was. My bandmates and I were in Germany because we could actually do shows in Germany and eat. So we were in Germany for weeks at a time. I went to a local record store in Munich. Munich is like their version of Tower. It's called World of Music, WAM or VAM. I went to VAM and I bought an Alan Vega CD for his solo album, Deuce Avenue, because I saw a review of it in a German magazine our, our, our brainiac guitar player can speak four languages. So I said, translate this for me, Chris. And he reads it. I said, I've got to get this record. I could not stop playing Deuce Avenue. It obsessed me. A year later, we're doing Lollapalooza in the summer of 1991. I have a day off in New York. I call my agent. I said, can you find a phone number for Alan Vega? I am doomed to meet this guy. And he goes like, let me look around. He finds a phone number for Alan Vega. I cold call Alan Vega from a hotel in Midtown. Like, yeah? I go, hi, is this Alan Vega? Yeah. He thinks it's like the cops or something. He's about to hang up. I go, don't hang up. My name is Henry Rollins, and I got your phone number from this agent. And he's like, oh, yeah, you're the black flag guy. I know who you are, kid. I said, okay. I have a day off from this big Lollapalooza contraption. I want to visit you because I'm obsessed with the Deuce Avenue album. Can I do that? And I can hear his hesitation. Like, do I want to let this maniac into my apartment? And he was like, yeah, kid. And he gives me his address. He was in the financial district downtown. And so I jump into a taxi. Uh, he buzzes me in. I ring his doorbell of his little apartment. The door opens this much. This bulging eye comes out. He's like, yeah. I'm like, hi, I'm Henry. And I probably look pretty intense to him. He opens the door, he lets me in. He said, you like coffee, kid? And I went, yeah. He was like, I warn you, kid, I drink mud. And as soon as he said, I warn you, kid, I drink mud, I just knew that he and I were gonna get along. And we spent the rest of the afternoon drinking coffee, going through his notepads, his sketches, hours of unreleased music. He is like this artistic dynamo, always sketching, always drawing, making sculptures, painting in acrylic and watercolor. He's like a nuclear power plant of output. And we become buddies that day. I go, I want to do a book with you. Some of these lyrics, some of these sketches, some of this artwork, what do you say? Let's do it. And so I, would, I was living in New York a, a couple of years later. I would go to his apartment and hang out with him and his amazing wife, Liz, and we would work on a book that eventually became Cripple Nation. And every Sunday, I'd walk from my tiny apartment, Lower East Side, all the way downtown to the financial district, pick them up, and we would go out and eat food downtown. And so every single time Alan would see me, he'd always grab my face, like, Liz, look at the kid, look at the kid. Oh, kid, kid, you look great, kid. Like, and like, he's a touchy-feely kind of guy, and he's just an absolutely wonderful person. And I ended up uh, publishing Alan, uh, writing forwards for his art books that came out in France, uh, putting out records that came out of his in Europe that, that no one in America would release. I released them. Uh, because Alan is the man, and they sold, oh, about 47 copies. Uh, like no one here bought them, uh, and I, I lost thousands of dollars putting out Alan Vega records. I have no regrets whatsoever. And so one day I'm walking to band practice, and I see Martin Rett, who's very, a very recognizable guy. Go online, you'll see what I'm talking about. Always has these big sunglasses. I'm like, whoa, Martin Rett. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm loath to going up and meeting people because I don't want anyone saying, hey kid, you bother me? It'll ruin my rock and roll fantasy. I'd rather just buy your records, buy the t-shirt and like think that everyone's cool like Ziggy Stardust. And so I go up to Martin Rev, I'm like, hey Martin Rev, my name is Henry, I'm a friend of Alan Vega. And he's like, oh kid, I know who you are, Black Flag, all right. And so I got to meet Martin Rev. 
And so these are friendships. Like I'm still pals with Martin Rev 150 years later. And Alan passed away, I believe in 2016. And the last time I saw him was the summer of 2015. Suicide uh, was gonna do a show at the Barbican Theater in London. Huge show, of course they've sold it out because at this point they're legends. And like Springsteen has covered a, 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 a suicide song. So they've made it. Anyway, um, I go to see them play in England because Alan's wife, Liz, asks me to fly to England and sing the encore with Suicide. I said, Liz, Suicide's a two-person band. They don't want anyone with us. They're like, Henry, you're like, I'm, I'm saying so. You're going to come out here and you're going to sing Ghost Rider with Suicide. And so I had dinner with Martin Rev the night before. Alan is in his hotel room because Alan has had a stroke. And so he doesn't communicate all that well, but on stage, he's still amazing. And so he kept one like, why are you here? Like, because he's had a struggle. I'm like, and I'm, like, I'm here to be, to be on stage with you. A minute later, why are you here? And finally I said, Alan, you owe me 40 bucks. I came all the way to London to get the 40 bucks. He's like, hey, he thought it was funny. Anyway, uh, I had dinner with Marty before the show the night before. I said, so can we do Ghost Rider at Soundcheck? He said, suicide doesn't soundcheck. I'm like, okay can we kind of come up with an idea of how we're going to do the song? He goes, we don't come up with ideas on how to do songs. And then he says, Henry, you know, suicide is just two people. I'm like, oh God, I'm so screwed. Like, why did I say yes to this? And so we go out for the encore and I do Ghost Rider with suicide. It's me and Alan and Martin on keyboard and synthesizer and me and, and Alan Vega on microphone. And it took me back to that, that attic, listening to Ghost Rider for the first time with Ian MacKay. And there I am, standing on stage with Alan Vega doing Ghost Rider. It ended up being the last ever suicide song, uh, suicide show. The last time Alan Vega ever sang that song. And it ended up being Alan Vega's last ever live performance. And wow. I was on stage with him. And so that kind of serendipitous all the way around thing is not lost upon me. And all I can say is, I'm just a lucky bastard because, uh, you know, I've gotten to do a lot of things. I've been in a bunch of movies, a bunch of TV shows and on and on and on. Uh, I miss Henry from the ice cream store. I'm the guy from the minimum wage working world. I got lucky to be in a band I liked. And from there, I don't know, things have been very interesting. And that was one of the, the cooler chapters in my life. So this, scene, this question asks, um, what about that fight scene? 